Hi church, I just wanted to say happy Father's Day Daddy O, hope it's a good one. Happy Father's Day Paul, we love you lots, have a lovely day, love us three. Venus. She's learning about planets. Happy Father's Day Dad, thank you for always being you, teaching me the ways of life, um, but always being there for me when life doesn't go as planned. Um, I know I'll always be your little girl. I appreciate everything you do. You're an incredible dad. I'm so blessed. Um, and I just love how you can still fit into children's headwear. Hi, Daddy. He loves his workshop Daddy. and rock and roll. Hi, Dada. He's got a hot rod, a heart of gold. Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day, Dad and Grandad. We love you and miss you and can't wait to see you. <laughs> you want anything to say, Reuben? To Grandad? I love you, Dad. Happy Father's Day! Wow! Happy Father's Day, Daddy. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Have a great day. Bye. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. <laughs> this one goes out to my dad, Mr. Ron Bennett. He's been joining us online every week since the beginning of lockdown from Cornwall. So hello to everybody down there in Cornwall. My dad is 81 years young and he is such an inspiration uh, and is such a great role model, not just to me, but now to his grandchildren and now to his great grandchildren. So I just want to say, dad, have a brilliant day. Thank you for being you and we'll see you soon. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to a very special dad and Bumpy. Say so love you Bumpy. And then say a very special Happy Father's Day to our Dad and Father's Day. Yeah, to, to Daddy, isn't it? To Daddy. Say so we love you lots and lots. Daddy, yo, yo. Can you blow a kiss? Bye. Bye. We love you. Happy Father's, Happy Father's Day, Day Dad. Dad. Have, Have a great, great day, day and enjoy, enjoy yourself. yourself. Happy Father's Day, Dad. And thank you for being an amazing granddad to Ezra as well. And also, Happy Father's Day to my amazing husband, who's a great dad to Ezra. He absolutely adores you and isn't even looking at the camera. That's just how much he loves you. <laughs> Happy Father's Day! Hope all the dads out there have a great day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. My dad's a hero to me. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. Hey, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Hope you have a great day, and I love you lots. So good morning everybody, welcome to another service, welcome to another Sunday of online services. It's lovely for you to join us, it's Father's Day today, we're going to have a great time celebrating what it means for God to be our Father. So we're going to start with a great song of worship, please join in. Who am I that the highest can would welcome me I was lost but he brought me in Oh his love for me Oh his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh it's free
last he has ransomed me his grace runs deep while i was a slave to sin jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun sets free oh it's free Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word this morning, Lord, would you give us ears to hear? Would you give us eyes to see? Lord, help us to understand what it means to be your child. Let's come and speak to us now. We're we're listening, Lord. Amen. Okay, well, I want to start with a few verses from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. This is from the New Living Translation. You can follow all these verses along in the notes if you're online. And it says, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Wow. So I've entitled this talk, Abba. And that has nothing to do with the Swedish pop group, by the way, but everything to do with how we can relate to God. And I'm going to give you the ending to this talk right at the start, because I don't want anyone tuning out and thinking that this isn't for them. Here it is. No matter what your history, no matter your family background or circumstance, you have a heavenly father who loves you like no other. 
cares about you more than you can imagine and is right there for you, believing in you and rejoicing over you. A dad who always listens, who isn't too busy or too pushy, but is faithful and available and knows what you need before you even know it. He won't ever leave you or reject you, but he will correct you justly and wisely with a longing to guide you towards a life that will make the most of your talents and abilities and grow you into the best version of you that you can be. Preparing you for an inheritance of life to come in eternity with him. That's who God is and that's what he does. So this talk is for everyone listening in this morning, whether you've got a dad or not, and whether you are a dad or not. I need you to lean in and listen as he whispers his words of love to you and me this morning. How do we know that God is for us? Well, Jesus teaches us to call him Father. And this is a direct reference to the character of God. Don't judge the word father based on your own experiences necessarily. In this context, when we talk about someone in, the ter in terms of, of a father, we are referring to someone who is the founder, the producer or the author of something, the one who is the origin or source of something, the one who accepts responsibility for something, the one who exercises paternal care as our protector and our provider. And that is what our Heavenly Father is like. But the title Father is, is greater than just what he can do and what he can provide. It describes a close personal intimacy. I read a quote this week that said, anyone can be a father, but it takes a real man to be a daddy because daddies are hands-on. They are present. They're touchable. You know, that's how Jesus referred to God. In his prayers, we, we hear him as he cries out, Abba, Father. The word Abba is a, it's an Aramaic word that means daddy, literally. It was a common term that expressed affection and confidence and trust. Abba signifies the close, intimate relationship of a father with his child, as well as the childlike trust that a, a young child puts in their daddy. Like I said recently, when we turn to our Heavenly Father, we're not conjuring up a genie to be at our beck and call. We're not calling on Father Christmas to indulge us with presents based on how good we've been or not. We are acknowledging the one who is loving and protective and supportive, who, who teaches us and wants the best for us. So who disciplines us but stays with us? and is always available to us. It's a reminder of who God is, his character traits that we can rely on, that we can be born into his family, adopted in as his own, loved, accepted. We can trust him. Romans 8 verse 15 says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves? Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children, now we call him, now we call him Abba, Father. That's the relationship he wants with us. That's the closeness, the intimacy we can experience. I wonder how easy or difficult it is for you to call God Abba. Father. The problem often with days like Father's Day it is it's when we're celebrating fatherhood and how great dads are. And that could perhaps ostracize those who, who don't live in that reality. I know from my own 
family line, how painful that can be. You know, even if you have a dad, chances are that he has fallen short in some way. You know, I'm father to, to three of the most amazing children, but I know more than anyone that I've been less than what they've deserved at times because I'm human and I get things wrong and I make mistakes. Anyone want to stand with me on that? You know, I've been the tired, stressy parent. I've been tempted to lash out when I've been driven to the end of my tether. I felt the sting of getting it wrong and, and the humiliation of asking my son when he was little, who's the best dad in the world? And getting the reply, Uncle Paul. It's like a knife to the heart. Doesn't feel like that anymore. It's not easy being a less than perfect father. But God isn't like that. And I am so grateful that he makes up for my shortfalls. And he really is the perfect dad that we all so desperately need. And he doesn't ostracize. He doesn't segregate. He doesn't reject. He's always inclusive. And you can know him as your father too. Psalm 68 describes him as a father to the fatherless. So even those, maybe especially those who have no earthly father to rely on, either present or not, or who have a father who is less than what he should be, you know, even they can know that there is a father who is more than able to meet their needs, who has been through a painful adoption process to bring you and me into his family. And he is waiting with arms open wide to lavish us with his unfailing love. Psalm 27 tells us, although my father and my mother have forsaken me, yet the Lord will take me up, adopt me as his child. Even if everyone else abandons me or turns their back on me, God won't. You don't have to live isolated or separated or alone or afraid. No one has to live without the love of the Father. And if you are currently living in that reality, then it is all good news for you today. Ephesians 2 verse 18 says, now all of us, all of us, that's including you and me. All of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, may come to God the Father with the Holy Spirit's help because of what Christ has done for us. All of us can come to know God as our Father no matter where we were born, no matter what our background is, and we come to know him through Jesus. 1 John 4 verse 9, this is from the message version. It says, this is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so we might live through him. This is the kind of love we're talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. There is only one thing getting in the way of us knowing God as our Father, and that is what the Bible calls sin. It separates us from Him. It damages relationships. It's a word that has I right at the center of it. Me first. It's the selfishness at the heart of each of us that turns away from God and tries to live independently of him, driven by self and doing what I want. It's the cause of so much hurt and pain and war and strife. And it acts like, literally like a cloud blocking out the light of the sun. But God could not bear to be separated from the world that he loves so much. So 
He made a way for that separation to be dealt with once and for all. And he sent his son, Jesus, to take the full force of his wrath against sin so that we could be forgiven. The cloud lifted, the veil removed, and we could be made right in his sight. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. He took what we deserved so that we could go free to know and enjoy a relationship with our heavenly father. The message of Christianity is not one of condemnation. It's all about restoration. Romans 5 verse 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. The good news is that God accepts you and me just as we are and right where we are. His greatest demonstration of love for us was when we were at our worst and when we were most lost and without hope. Yet, John 1 verse 12, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You can't earn the love of the Father. You can't make yourself right with him. But you can believe in the one who can. And you can receive the one who has given you the right to know your status as a child of God. He accepts you as you are. But he loves you too much to just leave you that way. He will transform your life as you follow him and you will inherit all that he has promised as you trust in him. A few years ago, I shared a story of a lady who's had a major impact on my life. And I'd like to share it again, if that's okay. She's easily in my Top 10 of people who have inspired me and influenced me the most. To me, she is one of life's heroes. And if the Bible is true when it says the first shall be last and the last shall be first, then she is in her rightful place of honor right now in heaven. Her name is Joan. She was born on the 25th of July, 1915 in Sheffield. But her family soon moved to a place called Melkridge in Northumbria, where she lived until she was seven years old. She had a younger brother, Ben, 15 months her junior, and her dad was a minor. She recalls a day when, having come home from school for lunch, her her mother crouched down in front of her and said, Ben and I are going to London to stay with your Aunt Daisy. Are you going to stay with Daddy or are you going to come with me? You know, some moments they change the course of your life. And I've got to tell you, that moment haunted Joan for the rest of hers. You know, even in her last years when she had lost a lot of her memory, she never forgot that day. After deciding to go with her mum and her brother, she remembers running back to school to collect her food tokens. And then a neighbour walking the three of them with their belongings up the hill to the local train station and they left for London. You know, she, she never saw or heard from the father she loved ever again. Never even got to say goodbye but she never forgot him. Even in her 80s and 90s, she, she'd talk about him, wondering what had happened to him in life. She cried at how much she still missed him. The pain of that separation never left her. 
You know, one of her last lucid conversations was about whether she would be reconciled to her dad in heaven, having prayed for him all her life, and whether her mum would have forgiven him and how wonderful that would be. Now, I don't know the backstory. I don't know why her mother, Gertrude, had run away from her marriage with two small children in an era where divorce was considered such a shameful thing. You know, life didn't get easier, though, for Joan. And after spending a month in London, she was shipped off to live with her grandparents in Norfolk for a year, only seeing her mum once a month while her mum worked as a chambermaid. Yeah, this was the, the Downton Abbey era. But then Gertrude got a job in London as a housekeeper. And Joan and Ben were moved into that house, living in two attic rooms. Although they were very much kept out of sight, not allowed to be seen or heard. Not easy for two boisterous children. Consequently, Joan spent her childhood playing out on the streets of London. And when asked where her dad was, she told the other kids that he was killed in the war. To her, that was more acceptable than the painful reality of separation. Joan was not a Christian, but she went to church at times like a lot of people did back then. But life events took over and she got engaged to a young man and stopped going to church altogether. However, one day, she bumped into a lady from the local Anglican church who asked her where she had been and if she was going to come to confirmation classes. And Joan was so embarrassed that she agreed to go, but made up her mind that she'd only go the once and that would be it. But God, God had other plans and she kept going back. And after six classes, she committed her life to Jesus and everything started to change, including at some point around then not marrying the man she was engaged to and instead falling for another guy in the church that she'd started attending regularly, a man called George Ballard. To cut a long story short, Joan and George married during the Second World War. George served in the Navy. They had two daughters and they settled down to what most would consider a quiet life in Kentish Town, London. But Joan had a heart for the lost and the lonely. She knew what that felt like. And her life became dedicated to making people feel a part of the family. Despite living in a small flat with two children who grew into teenagers, she and George had a steady stream of visitors to their home. And not one Sunday went by without someone spending Sunday lunch with her family. One such person was a, a young man who'd moved from Southport to London to train as a teacher. And he fell in love with Joan's eldest daughter. And the rest, as they say, is history. Well, my history, <laughs> to be exact. Because without Joan, my granny, Inviting Ron Bennett, my dad, to her house, I would never have been here. You know, she and my granddad, George, they, they supported many foreign missionaries. But Joan saw her little patch of London as her mission field. And she cared for so many people over the years that she lived there. And she brought many of them to that place of coming to know their heavenly father too, through Jesus. And Joan's life wasn't without further tragedy. She lost her younger brother when he was in his 40s. And my granddad died way too early when I was only 12 years old. All the important men in her life taken away. But my granny always knew the love of the father. Her faith and trust in him never faltered, painful as life was at times. You know, last week we were talking about devoting our lives to God. Well, for me, Joan sums up exactly what a devoted life looks like. But I don't think she ever really knew 
how powerful and influential she really was. You know, when I lived in London for a year, age 18, her flat became my refuge. And she always had the right words to say and would never let me leave the house without insisting on us, bringing my needs to our Heavenly Father in prayer. In 1988, she moved to Cornwall to be nearer my parents. And even then, just threw herself into visiting the, the sick and the elderly. I loved it when she talked about visiting the old folk, when most of the time she was older than they were. Now, she died just over 10 years ago, just before her 95th birthday, a life well lived. Not the best start, certainly not an easy life, no earthly father figure to guide her, no stability in her formative years, never rich or famous in the world's eyes. And she didn't leave much when she finally went home to heaven. But she was blessed in so many ways. And what an amazing inheritance she stored up for herself in heaven. And what a legacy she's left our family and beyond. You know, she could have lived out of her lack. She could have lived resentfully, thinking that the world owed her. But although she might not have grown up knowing an earthly father's love, she was a lady who absolutely knew the love of the father, her heavenly father. And his love made all the difference. And instead, she lived grateful and generous and devoted. And her life counted for so many Now, I hope those of you who can will have a great day today celebrating the wonderful dads and granddads and stepdads and uncles who are around today. But my, my message to you this morning is that regardless of your experience, no matter what your history, no matter your family background or circumstance, you have a heavenly father who loves you like no other cares about you more than you could imagine and is right there for you, believing in you and rejoicing over you. A dad who always listens, who isn't too busy or too pushy, but is faithful and available and knows what you need before you even know it. He won't ever leave you or reject you. But he will correct you wisely and justly with a longing to guide you towards a life that will make the most of your talents and abilities and grow you into the best version of you that you can be. Preparing you for an inheritance of life to come in eternity with him. That's who God is. And that's what he does. So I'd love it if we could finish this morning by just saying the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray it with meaning this morning as we cry out to our Abba, Father. Maybe this is the first time you're going to pray it, calling God your Father too. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Times have you found me wandering in the rubble of yesterday's hope, way down with burdens, barely standing by. I am desperate to see you again, to see you again. Running into your arms of grace With no reason to hide away It's not the first time I've been in this place I'm coming home again 
again I'm welcome home again How great the cost that paid my journey back You gave your only son and carried me home I am chosen How else could I respond? I've been captured by your unfailing love Your unfailing love I'm running into your arms of grace With no reason to hide away it's not the first time I've been in this place I'm coming home again I'm welcomed home again I'm running into your arms of grace with no reason to hide away It's not the first time I've been in this place I'm coming home again I'm welcomed home again Again, you always take me back. There's mercy in your eyes. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. There's nothing like your love. I'm running into your arms of grace with no reason to hide away. It's not the first time I've been in this place I'm coming home again I'm welcomed home again For your arms are open wide Your grace takes me back again You always take There's mercy in your eyes Just thank you, Lord, for loving me There's nothing like your love Your arms are open wide Your grace takes me back again You always take me back There's mercy in your eyes Thank you, Lord, for loving me. There's nothing like your love. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody, this morning. Have a great day, whatever you're doing. Go and tell the men in your life how much you appreciate them. And hopefully I'll see you back here tonight, 6 o'clock. Uh, but stay for the Westgate service. Why not? Starting just in a moment. Have a great week.